Welcome to the third and final part of our discussion of World War II. Now, after essentially losing heavily in Europe the first two years, two and a half years of the war, the Allies finally started to make some strategic advances. The first was winning the war in North Africa by 1943 by defeating the famous German General Rommel and his tank corps. In the Battle of the Atlantic, finally, after suffering heavy, heavy losses of both military vessels and merchant vessels, the Allies turned the tide because they started to break the German submarine codes, and this provided them with crucial information as to the location of, of the German submarines or U-boats. And in terms of strategic bombing of Germany, while many, many German civilians were killed in this bombing, it's generally recognized that the heavy bombing of Germany uh, made possible the successful Allied land invasion in France, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. I mentioned at the beginning of the first lecture the important role of intelligence in World War II, and we just talked a moment ago about how breaking the submarine codes used by the German Navy to its U-boats at sea was key to really reducing significantly the threat of uh, U-boats attacking merchant convoys from the United States to uh, Great Britain. Now it's important to realize that intercepting the enemy's communication and breaking the codes was not really decisive militarily unless they could exploit it on the ground. And a good example was which was held by the British. They learned through code breaking that the Germans were going to attack Crete, but unfortunately they did not have enough time before the planned invasion of Crete to reinforce the British troops in Crete. So Crete, important island in the, in the Caribbean, fell into German hands. And as I mentioned earlier, by this point in the war, the Allies had broken the main codes for the German Army, Navy, and Air Force, as well as the Japanese military codes. Uh, I might also mention that the Allies broke the German diplomatic codes, as well as the Japanese military codes. Breaking of the, excuse me, Japanese diplomatic codes, these are coded messages from German and the Japanese embassies around the world. And breaking the Japanese diplomatic code was particularly useful because it turned out that the Japanese ambassador uh, to Germany was particularly well liked by Hitler. And of course, the two countries were united in the war effort. But, the, but Hitler loved talking with the Japanese ambassador who returned to his embassy and wrote long, long detailed messages that pretty much uh, laid out Hitler's thinking. And since the Allies had broken the Japanese diplomatic code, as soon as those messages were transmitted by the Japanese embassy in Berlin, they were intercepted and deciphered and read by Allied military planners. Now, uh, the ultra system of breaking the uh, German codes could not be compromised. And this was a major, major concern of both President Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Access to the coded messages was highly, highly restricted. And when the information was passed to field commanders to take action on, the source of the information was always disguised it would often say something like, according to our spies or according to um, photographs taken by our airplanes, whatever. 
because they did not want that information to be received by the Germans, because if the Germans even suspected that their codes would be breaking, they would have changed the entire ultra system um, based on Enigma machines. And in fact, sometimes the Allies had to ignore the warnings they received and in intercepted messages because they didn't want the chance that Germany would know the codes would be compromised. Now D-Day, which was the Allied invasion of France in June 1944, was by far the most complex military operation in history. It was a total surprise for the Germans, so there was a great effort made to deceive the Germans as to where the massive military force would be landing on the French coast because success depended on surprise. <clears throat> this was done in a number of ways. I'll describe more when I show the next slide. Uh, a key element was the so-called double-cross system of German spies. The British intercepted every spy that was sent to Britain. Many were parachuted in, and the spies were generally given the option. They were told under international law, the British had the right, which they did, to execute them because they were not wearing uniforms and they were representing the German military, or their lives would be spared if they cooperated with the British authorities. And this was coordinated closely with the United States also. <clears throat> so what happened was those who refused to cooperate or were judged to be unreliable were simply executed or some were just put in prison till the end of the war. Those who cooperated were uh, under guard. They were, their radios that they had with them when they arrived were set up <coughs> and they were instructed to send messages back to Germany that contained some true information, um, but they also contained false information. Now, the British had to give them some true confidential information, which wasn't terribly important, so that these, they called turned or double-crossed system spies, uh, could have some credibility. <coughs> and a key element of this, for instance, was uh, reporting that when well, uh, Germany started sending rockets, uh, the v V1 and V2 rockets uh, targeted on London by reporting that the rockets had not gone far enough, therefore they needed to be sent a greater distance, which wasn't the case, and reading those messages, the Germans would uh, recalibrate the navigation equipment. And so, in fact, many, many of the rockets overshot London and empty and uh, landed in empty fields. Now, this was a very tricky operation. There are many, many good books and movies about it because there always was the risk that the German agents sent into Britain um, would be forced or coerced into cooperating with the British. So they were given special Morse code symbols to put in their messages, which would indicate that they were operating, um, forced to operate under British control to save their lives. Well, how did the British know when they were or weren't doing that? Well, unknown to the German spies, the British, of course, were reading the top secret radio messages um, being transmitted among the Germans. And so they were able to read the, the messages from the German intelligence service, the Abwehr, that were sent to Hitler and other senior officials. And they would almost always say, we do, you know, this person is sending reliable information and it's very trustworthy. In the few cases where it appeared that the German spy had made the Morse code error to indicate they were under control, uh, those German agents were executed. Bad weather was a key element. 
there was such bad weather on the English Channel when the operation was going to occur that the Germans assumed nobody in their right mind would send thousands of ships and hundreds of thousands of soldiers across the English Channel in such weather. So the Germans let their guard down. In fact, their senior commanders in Western France, uh, many of them returned to Germany to see their families and were not there when the action started. So D-Day itself, I mentioned, is the most complex military operation in history. There were incredible 5,000, that's correct, 5,000 ships involved with almost 400,000 soldiers and sailors. This is a simple map of the operation. I have circled in red the, the, the spot in France where the Germans fully expected the British, Americans, and Canadians to land. As you can see, it's called the Pas de Calais, C-A-L-A-I-S. And as you can see, it's very, very close to, to Britain on the left there. And that would make the most sense to move across there. Therefore, the, British, the Germans rather had put their heaviest coastal defenses there. Whereas the actual invasion occurred, as you can see, uh, much further to the southeast, excuse me, southwest along the coast, you can see the various dotted lines with the uh, various forces uh, landing at uh, beaches. And these were, some of these were American beaches and some of these were British, Canadian, and Australian soldiers landing. Also, there was a, a contingent of so-called free French. These were elements of the French army that had escaped to England before the Nazis totally took over France, and they participated in the invasion. So the key was to reinforce the Germans' belief that the invasion would take place in Calais. And they did that another number of clever ways. I already mentioned the fact that the reports from German spies who had been forced to work for the British would say that there was a heavy, heavy concentration of aircraft, landing craft, and soldiers um, near Dover, which you can see is uh, the English port just across from Calais. And what they also did that was quite clever is, by this point in the war, the British Air Force had complete control of the skies, but there were some German reconnaissance planes flying. So they let some of them sneak through and take photographs. Now they had to take photographs of something to deceive the Germans. So what they did is they actually constructed big rubber tanks. They were like balloons made of rubber, large, you know, full-size tanks. They were inflated and thousands of them were put out on the field as were thousands of dummy aircraft all made of inflatable rubber and uh, trucks, all kinds of things. They set up radio transmitters to sound as if there are hundreds of ships in the harbor. <coughs> and they, uh, the German plane flew overhead. They allowed it to return to France and its radio transmission as intercepted by the Allies. Um, was just what the Allies wanted, heavy concentration of troops in the Dover area just across from Calais. So this really, really helped confirm Adolf Hitler's <coughs> strong belief that that's the place where the invasion would take place. <coughs> also, as the invasion started, um, they could only invade a certain time of the month because they had to have the tides right. And on the the day in June 1944, two days before, three days before, there was heavy, heavy rain, uh, high winds, and the English Channel was very choppy. And that was forecast to continue through D-Day. And for that reason, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the German commanders had let their guard down. 
they let um, many of their commanders take a long weekend back in Germany to see their family or to travel to Paris just for a rest and recuperation. And the chief meteorologist for the British said that he believed that the, um, the weather would break and there'd be an opening on what they had planned to be D-Day because they, otherwise they'd have to postpone it for a month. The American commander of the invasion force, a general Dwight Eisenhower, who later became president of the United States in the 1950s, we'll see him a lot later, he had to make the decision, go or no go. It's pouring rain. The assumption is the rain and particularly the high winds would continue for about a week. But he had confidence in this young meteorologist. <clears throat> so he made the agonizing decision of let's go. And when the ships left southern England, there were huge winds, the waves were bad, virtually all the army troops and, and marines that were going to land were vomiting and seasick. But the good thing was, just as the meteorologists had predicted, the weather broke, they arrived a nice, clear, calm day, and totally, totally took the Germans for surprise by surprise. Now when the Germans realized that this major attack was taking place, the Allies continued their deception, so they increased the number of reports from the German spies in England under their control, and these reports essentially said, oh yes, but this is just a diversion attack. It's a diversionary attack in Normandy, where the, the section of France where the actual attack took place, and the real attack is going to take place in Calais. Uh, and the senior German leadership, particularly Adolf Hitler, believed that. And so he refused to move any of his large tanks, the so-called Panzer tanks, from the Calais region or more troops. And of course, the D-Day invasion in Normandy was not a diversion. That was the main area. This diversion strategy worked for about two weeks <coughs> um, until the Germans finally realized that the um, real invasion had taken place, the major invasion. But that was too late. That had given a chance for the Allied forces under General Eisenhower to move off the beaches and move inland. Also when they started to move the, the tanks and troops towards the Normandy area. It was made very difficult for the Germans because the French resistance movement had a very effectively cut a number of railroad lines and had destroyed uh, bridges that had been used, that were used by roads. So that slowed down the Germans for several days. <clears throat> now the first US units on on the Normandy beaches and D-Day had 90%. That's right, nine out of 10 of the soldiers and Marines who landed were killed within the first 10 minutes. They were met with very, very heavy resistance, machine gun fire and artillery fire. But by the end of the first day, 170,000 soldiers had arrived and they'd started to move off of the beaches. There was a risk that they would be defeated on the beaches or taken prisoner. And in fact, General Eisenhower had prepared two messages that he, his commander, uh, would deliver to the American people via radio. The first one was the message that he actually used was that after many hours of harsh fighting, they had moved off the beaches. The other was that he took sole responsibility for their defeat, and it was his decision and his decision alone uh, that had led to the defeat. So on the first day, they had, there were 11,000 Allied soldiers either killed or wounded in action. This is, of course, a lot of soldiers, but it was actually much less than General Eisenhower and the other commanders had assumed. By the end of the first three weeks, 
an incredible number of over 1 million soldiers had landed through the Normandy beaches and 200,000 tanks and vehicles. So that gives you an idea of the immense scale of this effort. <clears throat> this was really the turning point in the war. And so this is on the Western Front. And, but at the same time, and this was coordinated with the Soviets, they moved in toward Germany from the east. Uh, this is a photo, you may have seen similar photos before. Uh, these are people leaving the landing crafts. This isn't the first group. The first group that arrived, uh, you wouldn't have them standing there. They'd be, most of them would be killed. But this is later in the day after the beaches had been just um, secured. This is what some of the coasts looked like where they landed. You can see the cliffs. And in the foreground, you can see barbed wire. All these cliffs were barbed wire. And US Marine and Army forces arrived and somehow managed to climb up these cliffs with Germans shooting down at them and uh, to reach the large German guns that were shooting at the beach. <clears throat> this is a cemetery right behind the beaches. And these are the American dead um, on, on D-Day in the, the next day or two. And it's so impressive to go there in person. It's really depressing to see it. But the number of young men who were killed um, in an effort to defeat uh, the Nazis, these cemeteries are on property that was donated, given to the United States government by uh, the French government. And there are similar cer ceremonies, excuse me, cemeteries, uh, very close for the British, Australians, and Canadians killed. And there's also another cemetery for the many thousands of German defenders who were killed. Um, if you're ever in Paris, I highly recommend you take a, a day bus tour with a guide, go out and see the beaches, they'll explain it, and of course they will show you these cemeteries. And it's a real reminder of the horrors, the real horrors of war, because under every one of those crosses, or a Star of David for, for those of Jewish faith, uh, there, there lies a young man who had a mother, perhaps a wife, uh, and loved ones. So this map is a bit complicated to look at, but you can see the dark green are the Axis powers at the beginning of the war, uh, essentially Italy and Germany. And the lighter green is the maximum extent of the Axis of Germany and Italy's conquests in Europe. Uh, you can see um, in Northern Africa, Libya, and part of Egypt, um, where the Germans went across the desert. But you can see, just looking at the map of Europe quickly, the Germans took over Norway, Finland. They did not invade Sweden because Sweden declared itself neutral. Um, you can see they took over Denmark, all of sort of Eastern Europe, Poland, Romania, and the Soviet Union um, the very western part of the Soviet Union. And of course, they took over France and part of Northern Africa um, in Morocco and Algeria. Of course, they, they never took over Great Britain. Um, Ireland had declared itself neutral, as had Spain and Portugal. So the Normandy landings, uh, you can see going from the southern part of England towards France, and from there, the, the uh, Allied troops moved across France and eventually into uh, Germany. Simultaneously, well, slightly before, um, a year actually before uh, the Normandy lands in D-Day, Allied troops had in, invaded uh, Sicily, which is the island at, at the southern tip of Italy, 
And of course, Italy was still allied with Germany and then fought very rugged battles up through Italy. Um, now the famous Yalta Conference, the three major allied uh, leaders got together. This would be Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin of the Soviet Union. And they got together before Germany was defeated. It was obvious that Germany was going to be defeated eventually. Uh, this is after D-Day and progress is being made. And the Alta Conference is very, very important because it set the stage for the Cold War, which we'll t talk about in great detail in upcoming lectures. And the Cold War lasted from the end of World War II until 1989 and 1990. And one thing they agreed there was to set up the United Nations. And they would set it up to be more effective than the League of Nations, which had been set up after the First World War. And they also agreed that <coughs> with the Soviets advancing into Germany on the east and the uh, French and British and other allies um, attacking from the west, that they would divide Germany into sectors so after Germany surrendered, it would be divided into sectors. Now, this is a very, very important point for the next 50 years in US history, looking at foreign policy. The Yalta Conference gave Eastern Europe to the Soviets with the explicit promise that the Soviets would allow free and open elections in Eastern Europe. This would be Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia. Well, as you probably know, the Soviets went back on this promise. Once they had occupied these countries, they plundered them. They destroyed the factories and, and took uh, the valuable machinery back to the Soviet Union. And these East European countries never had a free, meaningful election with international observers. When they had elections, only candidates with the blessing of the Soviet Union were allowed to participate. So all of Eastern Europe was essentially under the control of the Soviet Union. And this included half of Germany, the half of Germany that the Soviets took over. Uh, we'll talk much more about uh, Eastern Germany, as it was called in the subsequent lectures. So Franklin Roosevelt, you recall, he'd been elected for a third time in 1940 with his famous promise of never sending American boys into war. And that, of course, was, was changed with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Well, he was reelected for a fourth term in 1944. Unfortunately, uh, Roosevelt was inaugurated in March 1945, and just a month or so later, he died uh, at age 63 in April 1945. By this time, it was clear that uh, Germany would soon be surrendering. Indeed, it surrendered, surrendered a month later. And we'll t talk in a minute about the great progress being made against Japan. So with Roosevelt's death, as provided for in the Constitution, the Vice President Harry Truman automatically became president. Now, the Germans surrendered in May 1945, and Hitler was reported to have committed suicide along with his uh, mistress, Ava Brown, whom he married at the last minute. And there's still a lot of controversy over this because no one has found a body that was definitively Adolf Hitler, leading to all sorts of theories that he somehow managed to escape and went and lived in Brazil or, some, or Argentina for many years. Well, so here in 1945, Hitler's rule, the Nazis, what they call Thousand Year Reich, or a thousand-year rule that they had anticipated ended. 
But before we turn quickly to the Pacific War, which still continued for several more months, the war against Japan, uh, just a few words on the Holocaust, which um, was not really known the full extent of it till the end of the war. There was certainly information that some Jews, communists, and others were being killed, um, taken from, to concentration camps and killed. The great extent of it really wasn't known until um, the Allied forces, oh sorry, until the Allied forces moved through uh, Germany and came across the concentration camps with all the horrors there. The Holocaust had been the final solution, as Hitler called it, for the six million Jews in Europe. Well, he didn't end up killing all the Jews, but that was his goal. He said the final solution, we can just get rid of all the Jews. But it's also important to remember that five million other people were killed, non-Jews. These were prostitutes, homosexuals, Catholic priests, people who were mentally ill, people who had learning disabilities, dyslexia, people who were physically handicapped, anyone who was not what the Nazis considered a perfect person according to their standards. Now let's turn briefly to the Pacific War. <clears throat> now, Japan had not signed the Geneva Convention. This is an international treaty on treatment of prisoners. There is a similar treaty right now in, in, in existence that allows, for instance, the Red Cross to visit, um, requires a certain amount of space for each prisoner, a certain minimum amount of food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but prisoners were much better treated in Germany. By prisoners here, I'm not talking about common criminals. I'm talking about um, allied uh, military personnel who were taken prisoner when they surrendered. And a real question people have often asked is, why are the Japanese, why were they so cruel with the prisoners and often tortured them, gave them virtually nothing to eat, and literally worked them to death, as well as the local populations outside of Japan, in China, Indonesia, everywhere they they conquered in the Pacific, because the Japanese on the home islands were very courteous people. There was very, very low crime. Well, as regards their prisoners, most people think it's basically because the Japanese had no respect for Americans or British who surrendered. They felt that a soldier should fight to the death, and any soldier who surrenders is despicable and a disgrace to the noble cause of being a soldier. As regards the very brutal treatment by the Japanese of civilians in the countries they occupied, and this is throughout Asia, some uh, psychologists believe it's because the soldiers were in a much freer environment outside their tightly controlled home society. Well, whatever the reason, there was, um, as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, um, there were terrible atrocities in China, uh, Korea, throughout the um, East Asia. And in fact, to this day, there is much resentment still in Korea, um, but people hearing from their grandparents and all the horrible treatment uh, by the Japanese occupiers, and the same thing is certainly true in China today. Uh, this is a map of World War II in the Pacific. This is the last three years from 1942 to 45, and the areas in green are those that were under Japanese control in 1942. As you can see here, they have taken over the Dutch East Indies, which uh, today is Indonesia, of course, um, the Philippine Islands, which are just to the north of that, many, many islands in the Pacific Ocean, and the great fear was that the Japanese would move in and um, 
invade Australia. And of course, Australia um, was one of the allied forces. Um, many, many people at, at this time were of British descent in Australia, and they provided many, many fabulous soldiers. So eventually, and I won't go through all the battles, you can read some of them in your textbook, and there are many, many books and movies and documentaries on these battles. But essentially, the Allied goal was to go to the heartland of Japan. And so they moved island by island through the Pacific. Um, they had great naval battles. I'll talk about one in a minute, but very, very heavy fighting because, as I mentioned a minute ago, the Japanese soldiers fought to the death. They almost never surrendered. And in fact, if it looked like they were going to be taken, they often uh, committed suicide rather than take, being taken prisoner. <clears throat> and so the Allied goal was to move in island by island to get close enough to engage in major bombing of Japan in the hope of white, wiping out their military facilities and later massive bombing of civilians. This is all before the nuclear weapon was uh, dropped twice in Japan in August 1945, which we'll get to in a minute. And again, I'm not going to go through all the many, many battles in the Pacific, just like I didn't uh, go through the many battles in the European theater. But one very significant battle was the Battle of Midway near Midway Island. And in this battle, the U.S. was able to sink four Japanese aircraft carriers while only losing one. And this was very significant because the Japanese industry, because of bombing, had no way to build any more carriers. Whereas the United States, of course, was not bombed in World War II and it had the opportunity to produce more carriers. So losing one aircraft carrier was bad for the United States, but it was not fatal. Japan's loss of four aircraft carriers was fatal to its um, Navy. It's interesting, it's the first major battle in history in which the two navies fought each other, but they actually never saw each other. All the warfare was done by planes leaving aircraft carriers. And why did the U.S. win? Well, apart from the heroic action of the soldiers, the sailors and uh, aviators, they won because they had intelligence. They knew, obtained by decoding messages, and they knew that the battle of, that the Japanese carrier fleet was approaching midway. They knew exactly from which direction and when. And so the U.S. naval commanders were able to position their ships and launch aircraft before the Japanese knew they were there. And when the American aircraft arrived, they were able, through massive losses of also American pilots, to sink four Japanese carriers. And this is a good example of where in a military situation, uh, having better intelligence than your enemy is of vital importance. Well, the U.S kept sending diplomatic messages to Japan through uh, neutral countries requesting Japan condition, a surrender. And they said Japan must surrender unconditionally and uh, the Japanese refused. So the war continued. There was intensive fighting for each island in the Pacific and the major reason for this is the Japanese simply fought to death. It was part of their martial code and it was not honorable to surrender. They had built tremendous defenses on these islands. They dug tunnels, they had caves, and it required the U.S. forces, and there were some British and Australian forces there also, Canadians, to literally go foot by foot through the islands often being shot by hidden uh, Japanese uh, snipers shooting from trees. Um, and it, there were tremendous, tremendous loss of allied deaths in fighting these from island to island. One of the most famous battles was Iwo Jima, uh, one of these islands on the way to Japan. 
and it's a small island, five square miles. Five square miles means it's like two miles by three miles, a very, very small island, but it was very crucial for the Allies to take control of that airfield. Well, 7,000 American soldiers died taking that piece of rock five miles, um, five square miles. Again, that's like uh, very, very small, um, two and a half miles long and two miles wide. Uh, 7, 000, and many, many tens of thousands were injured. In fact, throughout 1945, in these horrendous battles to move closer to Japan, closer to the Japanese uh, mainland, whether it was in the Philippines or the islands, the United States had 35% of its troops were casualties. This is by far the highest in World War II. Now this is a famous, famous photo of uh, five U.S. Marines. Um, you can, there's one in the middle there behind, but there are five putting an American flag on the top of a, a, a little mountain in, in Iwo Jima when the Americans had gotten control of that little mountain. The, the, this is really, really a famous symbol of the U.S. Marine Corps. And if you're in Washington, D.C., there is a, a wonderful statue of this in bronze uh, just across the Potomac River from uh, the mall there. Well, what's really sad to think that of these five Marines, this is an actual photograph, three of them were killed within the next week in continued fighting on the island. <clears throat> Another important island was Okinawa, which is part of Japan itself. It's a large island um, to the south of the main island. And it was fierce, fierce fighting there. 12,000 American soldiers died and 50,000 were wounded. These are tremendous, tremendous deaths to take small geographic areas. It's because the Japanese were fighting much more fanatically because they did not want their home island invaded. And this is when the Japanese pilots uh, started so-called kamikaze suicide missions. Kamikaze means wind from the east, and these were suicide missions. So a pilot would get into a plane. The pilot would be told he was going to be a hero dying for Japan. The plane was full of explosives. The plane only had enough gasoline to fly to the ships that it was supposed to uh, crash into. And this was a total surprise to the Americans. All of a sudden, uh, Japanese aircraft started coming in and they kept coming and coming and they, you know, a number were shot down, but many uh, got through and this caused tremendous number of deaths and sinking of U.S. ships, including aircraft carriers um, associated with the Battle of Okinawa. Well, the senior American, British, Canadian, and Australian commanders and politicians were actually shocked by this. They knew that the Japanese were wonderful so soldiers, very heroic, that they didn't surrender. But to actually see soldiers committing suicide by flying planes full of explosives into their ships just gave them an indication of the level of resistance they would get once they moved into the main island of Japan. And after the war, um, Japanese military officials uh, confirmed that they had massive suicide operations planned should the Allied forces actually land on the main islands of Japan. Uh, so basically with this information, um, the military planners estimated that winning the war would take roughly five more years, that's five more years, and over one million U.S. casualties. And this, given the information at the time and the number of 
of soldiers been lost was considered a very realistic expectation. Well, the U.S. goal was to get Japan to surrender. It was now pretty obvious who was going to win the war. Um, but the United States and its allies did not want to go through five more years of war and tremendous, tremendous number of casualties. And if they could stop that, and also it would save Japanese lives if the Japanese simply surrendered. Well, the Japanese refused even after Okinawa was taken. So the U.S., in addition to bombing military targets in Japan, decided to use firebombs on the capital city of Toyota. These are bombs that when they explode, they have something very flammable in it that would spread out. And many of the Japanese homes at this time were built of wood and it caused uh, about a million homes to be destroyed in one night. Yes, one million homes in the Tokyo area and other major cities were destroyed in one night and 100,000 Japanese were killed. And these are not atomic bombs. These are normal high explosives, uh, fire bombs. Again, the United States sent a message to the Japanese emperor and senior leaders that they must lay down their arms, surrender, and uh, for a peaceful uh, end of the war. The Japanese government again refused. So within a few days, the Japanese, excuse me, the American bombers uh, repeated what they had done in Tokyo. They repeated it in Tokyo and some other cities. Still, the Japanese refused to surrender. Now, at this point, for the reasons I told you before, the, Jap the American commanders were very, very reluctant to have a land invasion of Japan because they knew the tremendous resistance they would find, that many, many women had been given explosives and were prepared to, <clears throat> for instance, go up to the troops and blow themselves up uh, uh, but, but while killing um, one or more uh, American soldiers. So the American goal at this point was to get the Japanese to surrender because they really did not want to invade the home islands. And there are a lot of historical sources you could read on this. <clears throat> so this brings us to the atomic bomb, the nuclear bomb. The United States had developed one. Uh, there were only three bombs that they had constructed. This was obviously a very top secret effort um, in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, by you know, Albert Einstein was involved and many, many top physicists and mathematicians. So they had three bombs. Well, they wanted to see if it worked. So they had a test bomb out in the middle of Nevada in a desert. And people were astounded with the power of the bomb. And it was even more than the physicists had uh, calculated. So now the question was, they have this new weapon that causes massive destruction. What to do? Some of the US gar government argued, well, we should invite representatives from the German, excuse me, the Japanese uh, government and military uh, to come on a US ship and have a see a demonstration that the Americans would find a small, uninhabited Pacific island and explode one of the bombs there. And hopefully after seeing that demonstration, the Japanese officials would go home and convince the emperor and everyone else to resign. That was certainly, no, there was no guarantee of that. They had not, not resigned, surrendered. They had not surrendered after the massive firebombing of Tokyo and other cities. And a practical problem was they only had two bombs left after they had tested. Uh, so if they used one in a demonstration, then they'd only have one left. May or may not work. Or what happened if they invited the Japanese for the demonstration and the bomb didn't work? And so they had someone had to make a decision. Well, the person who makes a decision in such instances 
is the commander in chief of the US military, who, who of course is the president of the United States. So President Harry Truman made the decision to use the atomic bomb. So the, the decision was to use one bomb over Hiroshima, let the Japanese see the destruction, send them another message asking that they surrender and sign a peace agreement. And if not, there would be another bomb. Um, that's what happened. So in August 1945, the famous Enola Gay aircraft, which by the way, you can see the same aircraft, Enola Gay, in the Smithsonian <coughs> Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. It dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, which had many defense industries, but there were also many civilians who were killed. And an incredible 170,000 people were killed by that bomb. Many, many of those were killed instantly. Um, some died a day or two later, and others died many months later. Um, no one in the United States or elsewhere really knew the impact of such radiation on the human body. Um, and it was just tremendous, tremendous uh, destruction. Well, as they planned, the U.S. sent a message to the Japanese saying, we have many more bombs. Actually, there's only one more. And we're fully prepared to use them unless you surrender. <clears throat> Unfortunately for everyone, the Japanese refused. So three days later, the uh, shipbuilding center of Nagasaki was uh, received the second and last atomic bomb um, that the Allies had. And there, of course, many, many more people were killed, including many, many innocent civilians, women, and children. Finally, after that, uh, and, and I think in the long run saved lives on both sides, the Japanese decided to surrender. And by the way, the reason they were worried because they only had two bombs left is the estimate it would take another six months to build another bomb. So um, it was fortunate that the Japanese surrendered at this point. <clears throat> the Japanese surrendered with one condition, the emperor stay in power, and the allied agrees, uh, the emperors agreed to that. Now the question that many have asked, and I'm sure you're asking yourselves now if you haven't already, was this the right decision? Well, I think we have to put it in historical context. Was it the right decision at the time with the information they knew? And reasonable people can disagree on that as to whether they think it was the right decision or, or not. The alternative was um, continued massive bombing from the air with as many or more casualties. And of course, this began the atomic age. Now, I'll just note here, um, before we move on to the legacy of the war, that the German government had tried to develop its own atomic bomb. The Germans had wonderful physicists and scientists, and they were well on their way to developing an atomic bomb, which they planned to uh, deliver to uh, London, other major British cities, and they hoped to be able to eventually uh, uh, send uh, an airplane you know, on top of a submarine over to drop one on New York City. But the German program was delayed for about a year because British commandos uh, were able to destroy an essential ingredient called heavy water that was being shipped from a Norwegian uh, plant that produced it it was being shipped across a, a fjord in Norway, a very, very deep uh, ravine full of water to Germany. And the saboteurs the night before, <coughs> um, actually the saboteurs were Norwegians. Uh, they had been uh, working with British commandos. Norwegians received a message that despite any civilian loss, they must destroy the heavy water. It's, it's a it's a type of um, chemical they call it heavy water because I think it, <coughs> instead of being H2O, I think it has one more oxygen um, atom, but I'm not sure about that. But anyway, it's an essential ingredient 
uh, for a nuclear bomb development, and the Norwegian uh, resistance went into the ferry that was full of the uh, heavy water barrels and put a bombs, and it was precisely timed, so as the ferry was leaving, and it was over the deepest part of the fjord, about 1,500 feet deep, and, and it sank. Now let's take a step back. <coughs> Excuse me. What was the legacy of World War II? Well, the most obvious and immediate and horrific legacy was the tremendous loss of lives. 50 million civilians were killed in World War II, and about 20 million members of the military died. So more than twice as many civilians died as military. So this is what's meant by total war. Their casualties, uh, not just for military, but civilians. And of course, in addition to this, there were many tens of millions <coughs> of, people, of civilians as well as military, uh, more than 100 million, who were severely uh, injured or wounded, uh, many spending the rest of their life in a wheelchair or perhaps paralyzed um, or lost an arm or leg. Uh, one thing that's often overlooked, as, particularly as Americans, we look at U.S. history, we tend to focus just on what the U.S. did. But for every American killed in World War II, 59 Soviets were killed. That is tremendous. 59 Soviets were killed. And not all of them were military. There were many, many so, uh, Soviet civilians killed when the Germans invaded <coughs> Russia. And as for Americans, there were approximately 400,000 American deaths, a tremendous number of deaths. And I'm going to show you the next slide. This is, this is the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. It's on the famous mall that runs from the Capitol to the Lincoln Memorial. <clears throat> and see all these stars? Each star represents 100 American military killed in the war. And this is only a segment of the wall. I mean, I, I haven't seen ever, a, when you stand there in person, it's incredible as you look. Each star represents a hundred American soldiers killed. So there was tremendous, tremendous loss of life and death on all sides, on all sides. Well, as a result of the war, China became communist under Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao Zedong had formed a united front uh, with non-communists to fight the Japanese. And at the same time, quickly after the war, um, by 1949, he had ousted the nationalist leader, Chiang Kai-shek, and, and China became a major communist country. And we'll talk a lot more about that when we get to the Cold War. The colonial empires in Africa and Asia soon ended. The Soviet Union emerged victorious, albeit with heavy, heavy losses, but it was a new global superpower. It had increased its industry. It had taken over Eastern Europe and roughly half of Germany. We'll talk more about that in the Cold War and became a global superpower. Now, again, at the end of the war, the Soviet Union was a strong ally of the United States. That will end very shortly. And the U.S. was really, as people would say, at the summit of the world. It had led the invasion of France in D-Day and had led the fight against um, uh, Japan. So the American military was by far the most dominant in the world at the end of the war. American industry was by far the most dominant in the world, and American diplomacy was viewed as the strongest and the best in the world. Again, we'll see much more of that in the next few lectures. A major impact of World War II was the authority and size of the federal government in Washington expanded significantly. <coughs> also, at the same time, the authority of the president himself expanded, increased. The Great Depression was over. Um, we've talked about this before. When the United States 
in the late 1930s started to massively increase industrial production production of war material to send to Britain that, and um, and to France before its defeat that greatly increased employment and it's generally considered the reason the depression ended. In 1945, at the conclusion of the war, the U.S. totally dominated the global economy in terms of production and exports. We'll see that more later. <clears throat> there were many new technologies developed during the war, and they greatly helped the private sector. And you know, one of those obvious technologies was radar, which was soon adopted by commercial airliners. And there were also some opportunities that opened up during World War II, and it started the process for the civil rights movement of the late 1950s and 1960s. We saw how many blacks moved from the South, North into factories or Washington, D.C. to work for the government. The, um, and those blacks who fought in the military uh, did so with great valor and distinction. And in fact, as we'll see a little later when we start talking about the civil rights movement, the first major institution to desegregate and allow equal participation by blacks turned out to be the U.S. military um, uh, because the U.S. generals said they don't care what color a person is as long as they are brave and they fight well and the blacks did a wonderful job fighting in World War II and so the U.S. military desegregated before any other major institution in the United States. Well this ends our discussion of World War II. Again it's been at a fairly general level. Um, if you're interested in any of this there are many many books and videos and articles to explore on your own even more. Uh, thank you very much.